forests. For most of us, these are places of enigmas and mysteries. More than half of all trees, both evergreen and deciduous, grow in these huge clusters. They're an important component of our climate and home to countless animals. More than 2,000 hectares of these lands have been protected by the Rostochia Biosphere Reserve for the last 35 years. The hilly upland territory of Rostochia, covered by the dense caps of its forests, extends northwest from Lviv to the territory of Poland. This is like some sort of green bridge on the Ukrainian-Polish border, connecting western Ukraine and eastern Poland. The territory of Rostochia is small, occupying only 12 hundredths of a percent of the territory of Ukraine. But it provides shelter for almost a third of the vascular plant species growing in Ukrainian soil, and even more animals. Three quarters of the species live here. The forests of the Rostochia Biosphere Reserve are a corner of nature with very high biological diversity, including invertebrates. Moreover, the forests developed quite harmonious relations with them. To a certain extent, they are dependent on each other. A whole underworld hides in the underlay of the plants. Fallen leaves that rustle underfoot play a very important role in the life of the forest. After rotting, they turn into an accessible form of nutrition for plants, but first and foremost, they create a home for the majority of insects living in this natural habitat. Uh, the greatest threat to them is the destruction or disturbance of the forest underlay. It is destroyed by the overload of tourists or clearing of the forest when the trees are felled. In order not to destroy the underlay of the forest, territories of the reserve limited the number of tourists. Regular visitors to these territories are park staff and research scientists. Even for fast movement, they use the most non-invasive modes of transport – horse-drawn carriages. This way, they move to different territories of the park on a cart in order to inspect all the monitoring sites. To understand which species of insects settled in a certain part of the forest underlay, they use the so-called barber trap. In this case, this is a regular half-liter glass jar. It is placed into a hole at the level of soil so that the edges of the trap do not pose any obstacle to insects. As a result, everything that crawls on the forest underlay gets trapped in the jar and has no way out. Then this material is sorted out in the laboratory and specialists determine the types of insects we caught. To ensure that the experiment is not contaminated, several such traps are installed, up to 10 of them, in a test area within 10 meters from each other. To protect the trap from rainfall, they add a roof made of a piece of bark. Okay, here it is. Oh, they're escaping. One of the most numerous species of insects on the forest underlay is ground beetles. There are about 15 species of them in the Rostochia Biosphere Reserve. We now come across three of them. One of the largest ground beetles is Caribus coriaceus. The elytra are wrinkled, black and one of our largest beetles. Черный 
This time, the entomologist's catch in barber's traps did not contain endangered red list species. Such finds are rare, even in nature reserves. If one specimen is found each year and some species are even less common, then scientists consider this a great achievement. The reserve's entomofauna is one of the most studied in Ukraine. Up to 3,000 species are registered here, and the research still continues today, so the numbers will increase by orders of magnitude. Scientists are also very interested in the ornithofauna of Rostochia. The very Shitsa river flows within the borders of the reserve. It's a left tributary of the Dniester river. A cascade of artificially created ponds stretches along its channel, stretching out for more than 90 kilometers. 56 mirror-smooth patches surrounded by dense vegetation attract wading and water birds. At dawn, they flock up to the sky in search of food. Before the sun's rays light up the entire horizon, the birds have a chance to fly unnoticed by predators or fowl hunters. They all nest here. There is a colony of gulls and about a dozen species of ducks, and sometimes one can even spot a grey goose or a mute swan, diving so deep that only the tail sticks out above the water. They look for algae and other plant foods at the bottom of the pond, though they also won't refuse to catch insects, small fish, tadpoles and crustaceans. Ponds are also valuable in terms of a nutritive base. Fish are fed with compound feeds, enriching the feed resources of water birds in their overall biomass. Each spring, ponds are filled with water for breeding fish which can enjoy additional fodder for rapid growth. This ensures the full-blooded and even well-fed lives for all the local fauna, as well as for those fowl that stop to rest here during migration. Ponds along the Vereshitsa River form one of the most important ecological corridors for bird migration. It has been here since time immemorial, and birds have constantly taken advantage of it. This region is relatively poor in the wetland complexes. So it is one of the few routes that is very critical for migratory birds. A lake surrounded by dense thickets of reeds and grass weed attracts many birds to its water basin. But the mute swan doesn't like sharing its territory with any other birds. Such large birds need a lot of food to feed their family and raise their chicks. A mute swan is a species of a bird that guards its territory aggressively. This species is the large in size among our water birds. If a couple settles in a small pond, they become very aggressive towards their neighbors. Neither ducks nor coots nest next to them. If several couples make nests on a pond, this will possibly be fatal for the rest of the water birds. Swans prefer living in couples and devote a lot of time to the family. Most often, they retire to places that are totally inaccessible to humans. However, in these ponds, swans are very trusting. Moreover, when they see a person, they swim closer to them with the hope of getting a treat. On average, the number of chicks in their families doesn't exceed five or six. From the first days of life, the chicks already show independence. Almost immediately, they go swimming, try to find food, but despite this, they feel parental care constantly. Even when they seem all grown up, the female and the male still never take their eyes off of them. 
They never touch the treats and display obvious wariness by making some kinds of hissing sounds, so it was not in vain that they were called mute. Several mute swan couples nest on these ponds. Just 20 to 30 years ago, it was a rare species that could only be seen during the migration season, and much less frequently during the winter season. Nowadays, seeing a swan on the Rostocha ponds should not come as a surprise. The proud posture, the nobleness of this bird, the fidelity that it displays towards its partner, all these features are still a great delight for people and incite their admiration. The birds hatch annually, but do not remain for the winter. The ponds where the swans feed are drained in the winter, so mute swans have to migrate to worn lands that are rich in forage. These fairy tale lands of peace and comfort attract many animal and bird species. A thousand years ago, monks from the Kiev Petrovsk Lavra found a new home here. On the left bank of Vereshitsa River, in the bowels of a mountain that towers above the hilly Rostocha ridge, they founded a hermitage. Monks manually expanded the tectonic cracks, carving caves in sandstone monoliths. This cave is in the tears of the Tortonian sandstone. Not a very hard material. It's certainly not granite or another rock. It's sandstone. There were no problems working with it. This was a place where the monks lived and served God. The cave church still contains a stone cross made in the 11th century and a stone confession chair. There is a stone carved altar near the main wall. An eternal fire burns in a recess on top of it. In this monastery, the devotees spend their lives to prayer and fasting. They secluded themselves in small niches and monastic cells under low arches. The passages in the monastery's underground stretch through narrow forked corridors up to 270 meters long. However, according to an ancient legend, they were considered endless, leading all the way to the caves in which hermits lived in Kiev. There is even a legend about a hare that was released into the Strach cave and ran out of the Kiev Petrovsk Lavra. It is a symbol of unification of Ukraine, east and west. It is known that the monastery existed until the mid 13th century. In those turbulent times, when local residents had to escape from the raids of Tatars, the cave monastery was a secure haven. But one day, when the nomadic conquerors were once again returning to the east, one of the people hiding in the cave shot a Tartar warrior. The nomads didn't dare to enter the monastery. They tried to smoke the people out, covering the entrance with branches and setting it alight. No one came out of the cave. They all suffocated there. According to a legend, the Mother of God, mourning the executed, stood as an unbreakable wall to protect the peasants. Now, a village called Stradj, which means execution, has appeared on the site of the burned settlement. To commemorate these events, thousands of pilgrims flock to the monastery to march in procession to the Church of Our Lady in the Stradj mountain. In terms of status, the procession of this temple is equated with the Jerusalem procession. The temple conducts a daily service. Pilgrims from all over Ukraine are drawn to this monastery. On July 26th, a pilgrimage to Strach Mountain is held. Tens of thousands of believers come here from everywhere. But even this popularity doesn't rob these lands of their peace and comfort. Even sandstone rocky outcrops are a comfortable place of habitation, for example, for relict ferns. One of the smallest representatives of this genus, the maidenhair spleenwort, adorns the entrance to the cave. 
This mountain fern is rare for Rastochia and grows in a green bush no more than 20 centimeters high. Maiden hair spleenwort is a characteristic plant for mountain systems of Central Europe. Here they are tied to rock outcroppings. We encounter it in small populations or even as single specimens. There we see another mountain fern, the hard shield fern. It grows comfortably in the shady beech forests. The relic ferns and beech forests remind one of the prehistoric past of the local lands the surviving cave temple, about their troubles and a tumultuous antiquity. And the forests are indicative of the natural wealth of this region. No matter how much humanity destroys them, the forests display incredible resilience, if given the chance, as they are capable of recovery, just like the vast numbers of animal and plant species that we had at one time lost.